Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. I have um, been assured that the challenges with the heating system have been or are being addressed, and I'm hoping, hoping this room will get a little warmer. Um, although I know that um, just having all of the opportunity to have all the participation will hopefully, uh, you know, uh, keep you all here in a nice warm setting. So, uh, welcome everybody. I, I'm holding this microphone for the camera in the back, so it's what's up? You can't hear. Okay. <laughs> all right. Can folks in the back hear me? Raise your hand in the back if you can hear me. I don't want to yell so loud that I am overpowering the folks in the other rooms, too. We don't have a PA system in these rooms, because if we did, it would quickly overwhelm everything going on everywhere else. So um, I want to thank you all for coming out for the second of our two um, uh, vision discussions. Um, the first one of these we did on a uh, weeknight in early January. Um, I, I'm just out of curiosity, a show of hands, how many people were here for that January 7th meeting? All right, so we have just, uh, just one or two. Um, and uh, this is essentially a, a repeat of that effort because we wanted people to have multiple chances to participate if they couldn't make a weekday or a weekend. We had about 100 or so people come to our last meeting. Um, this one, we are trying a new experiment where we are running this session simultaneously in five different languages. So we hope to get feedback in five different languages and have the opportunity for that to help us. Um, again, if you haven't picked up this, if you are more comfortable with this presentation in Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, or Nepali, there are those other four rooms where we are running the exact same presentation. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm George Proakis. I'm director of planning here at the city of Somerville. Um, I am here today um, with a team that consists of folks from principal group in Util that have been working with us, Russ Preston, um, Tim Love, and um, his team, um, Drew, um, and folks from Util. Also, we have people from the development team, US2, that has been working on the, um, as our the team selected master developer partner for certain portions of Union Square. Um, they're gonna tell you a little bit more today about um, the block we call D2 and D3, the area up by the future Green Line Station at Prospect Street. Um, Greg Karczewski from the D2 team, from the um, US2 team is in the back and from their design team, um, we have Alfredo, Eric, and Kate who are also along with us and will be, uh, will be um, doing part of the presentation today. I just want to really briefly, um, well, there's, there's all of those folks, um, just give you an idea of where this meeting fits into our schedule. Um, we are doing a neighborhood plan for Union Square. It is based upon the work we've been doing on an overall um, planning for neighborhoods in the city. It also relates to the work that, we're, that the developer is doing on the particular portions of Union Square that they're working on developing. But the plan is also intended to really talk about the entire neighborhood and how areas to be developed as well as areas to be preserved all fit in together. Um, we did a little walking tour today. We looked at D2, which is a site that's mostly clear where development will be happening. We also looked at places like Somerville Avenue and Bow Street, um, where we've heard a lot of feedback on people wanting to do much less development and more uh, kind of retaining the character of what we have. And we're focused on all of that. We have put together this schedule of what we're doing to produce a neighborhood plan during 2015. One of the challenges of this process is because of the T-Station starting construction this, this year and because of the interest in making sure that with that T-Station we don't have a lot of um, the construction of the development around it going on at the same time. We're very focused on making sure that the, the plan for the site closest to the station be something that we move forward quickly uh, while at the same time continuing to plan for the overall neighborhood so we're looking at keeping those two things going this is a very overwhelming chart of schedule i will only say that there's a lot of pieces going on here a lot of meetings we make sure to advertise them as we can on city websites the most important thing coming up beyond this is um, that in early March, we're having a three-day charrette where we'll be working on site here and people can drop in and we'll have a series of topic meetings on the future Union Square. That's March 9th, 10th, 11th. Between now and then, there are four meetings on four Wednesdays and Thursday night. I mean, Wednesdays, Wednesday nights in February talking about specific issues related to planning in Union Square. And um, the design team, the development team will be working with us on leading a lot of that and we will be... Um, um, looking forward to having you participate in those, and we'll have more information about those as we go in our presentation. I want to turn this over to Russ, who will be doing the, um, the, the main section of our beginning presentation and uh, leading the first of our public uh, discussion sessions today. So, all you. Thanks, George. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Russ Preston. Um, I'm with Principal Group. Uh, so, we, uh, 
we want to give you a little bit of context about uh, where we're at in the process. This is actually our third meeting now. This is a repeat of the meeting we had earlier this, this month that George mentioned. Um, so just to orient everyone, um, you know, we're, we're in the post office here in the center of Union Square, but our study area is much larger uh, area is surrounded in blue. And so you'll have, you have maps, aerial photography of maps of Union Square with the same outline on your tables that we'll be looking at later. But this sort of is, is the extent of our uh, study area for the neighborhood plan. This is a fuzzy line. So if there are issues or ideas that are outside of this, one for example is you know, kind of coming over to the Washington Street uh, new tea stop, you know, we can look at those as well. So keep that in mind as we kind of talk about things today. So our agenda, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we've heard to date so far. Um, and then the mapping activity is what we'll be doing first, which is uh, the large base maps and the, the Sharpie markers that you have in front of you. Uh, then there's a visual preference survey, which you also have a stack of photo photos uh, of various architectural and public space types that we want your feedback on. And I'll go into the instructions for that a little bit later. Um, and then we're going to hand it off to the US2 team. They're going to give us a little bit of uh, uh, introduction to the, develop, the specific redevelopment parcels uh, right around the train station. So it's really important from a community standpoint that we move those projects as well uh, forward in concurrent with the train station so that when you get off the train in a few years, you can walk into a, a new place and new development and comfortable sidewalks and not into a construction site. So it's really important that the, these two processes dovetail together and we kind of look at them both at the same time. Uh, and then we're going to all report out. We want to actually have each table tell us your three biggest ideas, what you've talked about in the context of these three activities so that we can all hear from each other. Uh, so why do we create a neighborhood plan? This is a question we ask ourselves a lot. It comes down to summer vision. How many folks have read the city's comprehensive plan? All right, we have copies in the front so folks can take a look at it and it's online. It's a great guiding document for how can we, as a city, look at each neighborhood and contribute to the larger goals of, uh, of, Summer, of Somerville. So this was a two and a half year process. A lot of community meetings were involved with this. Um, and you know, this is sort of a word cloud. And you can see a lot of the, the phrases uh, about you know, what is the character, what is the diversity, what is meaningful for Somerville as a city. So this has been um, codified, essentially, in this map. And you can see the three important areas are blue areas that are around transit nodes and transit corridors, green areas that are conservation, which is essentially the residential fabric, the residential streets of the city. And then these orange areas are transformation areas where substantial new economic development can occur. Um, so it's important because Union Square actually has all three of those as a portion of the, of the neighborhood. So we're dealing with a lot of different conditions in the neighborhood, depending on which area we're in. Boyne Yards is much more about new development, commercial opportunity there, versus the very, you know, sort of in the square, you know, looking at the sidewalks and sensitive infill. Um, and there's some goals that have been set out in this comprehensive plan that we need to talk about as well. And how does, how does Union Square participate in reaching those? Um, so what did we learn at the first meeting? We, you know, we've had a crowdsourcing event held in this, uh, in this space uh, and we asked folks to do a survey. This survey is still available online, so if you haven't taken it, uh, visit SomervilleByDesign.com and you can take the survey. It'll be up through the uh, end, of the, end of February. Uh, but the results, I wanted to show you the sort of the top um, agreed upon things that came out of the survey so far based on, on what we've seen. Uh, the first is this idea of flexible public space, that really that there needs to be more public space for folks in Union Square. Uh, it was very important for folks that we have new commercial and resident, the residential development preserves the character. So we need to know from you, well, what is the character of Union Square? What is actually that vision for, uh, uh, for what contributes to the character of Union Square? And then the ability to safely bicycle around the square was another one that folks found really uh, important. Uh, independently lo and locally owned Main Street businesses and commercial, that there's actually some uh, authentic businesses and street life here was, was a really important. And then the, by far the most agreed upon issue is the, that walking around should be safe and enjoyable. Um, so before I dive into those in more detail, I wanted to also give you some feedback. We asked everyone, what do you want to hear about specifically related to the, the redevelopment parcels, D2 and D3? 
So in February, we're having four workshops um, each, each Wednesday in February. These are the dates. And we had a selection of topics. So the topics that, that have been chosen based on your feedback are this the first one and the fourth is placemaking. You know, what about, you know, what, what are the retail, art, culture, how does that all interact with the new development? And then on the 11th, the actual, the context of a real estate market in general, like how does, how does Union Square fit in with what's going on in the market in the greater Boston area? And then on the 18th is the realities of the project. This is dealing with issues around brownfields, issues around the transportation, the parking, all the sort of criteria that the design team has to work around so that you know, everyone in the community understands those conditions as well. And then on the 25th of February, we'll talk about the actual design, the massing, you know, how, how are those uh, parcels going to look and feel um, so that you know, when everyone comes into the charrette in March, you get an idea of what uh, the D2 and D3 parcels are going to look like and interact with uh, the larger neighborhood. So, uh, how do we, you know, so how do we use this sort of feedback and what are some ideas that we can start to think about uh, in the context of, of Union Square? So the first one, walkability. Uh, you know, this, this sort of is the intersection there at Prospect and, and Somerville Lab. And you know, for anyone wa walking, you understand it's not the most friendly s space. So a lot of that comes down to, you know, vehicle conflicts with walkability. So we wanted to say, okay, what's the, uh, the car ownership, you know, how does that, you know, if, if it's easier to drive, people will. So that's always the first point with walkability. But you see Union Square in the context of the city actually has a fairly, you know, one of the lower car ownership percentages. Uh, so the other thing is, how do we actually encourage folks to walk? They have to feel safe. So this is some uh, a mapping app online looking at uh, data for uh, fat pedestrian fatalities associated with car impacts uh, up through 2009. And the blue is a, is a pedestrian injured, cyclist is green, and then uh, this uh, purple color is a vehicle occupant. So you can see there are some fatalities around the neighborhood. Um, so we all, I always start there thinking, okay, if people are getting killed by walking and, and bike, biking, what, you know, bicycling, how do we uh, deal with those issues? And one of the biggest ways to do that is to slow cars down, to actually make the street safer by getting it under 20, 20 miles per hour. And you can see here a substantial chance, your chances of survival are much greater at 20 miles per hour uh, than even 30 or 40. So the city has started to look into ways to improve Union Square in this regard already. You know, there was a better block project and a temporary crosswalk and parklet that was installed earlier this summer. So there are really quick solutions to getting the Union Square more walkable right now. Um, but you know, thinking about more aspirational ideas, you know, sort of longer term is you know, this idea of, a, of slow spaces, of spaces where cars and humans interact very nice, nicely together. And you, know, you see a lot of these when you travel around Europe or in other parts of, of the country. Uh, but the idea that, you know, that everyone can behave and, and be, uh, uh, all forms of transportation can exist in the same place at the same time. So this is an idea that we started thinking about. How can we start to think of the streets in Union Square as public space as well, not just as transfer, transportation infrastructure? Uh, so walkability has been a buzzword around Somerville for a long time. This is Jeff Speck, who was here a few years ago, working at so, some of the, the Green Line Station area, Gilman Square and, and Lowell Street. Uh, but he said that Somerville is almost the most walkable city in the country. So this is, you know, we can push that further here in Union Square. Um, so the next idea is this idea of unique and, and locally owned businesses. And there's some, a few things I wanted to mention here. One of the questions I have is what else is missing in Union Square that needs to go here? Um, you know, it's not just all about ca sidewalk cafes and, and coffee houses, but the, you know, if you look at some of the most authentic places, retail Main Street districts in the country, they have this sort of list of uses, the sort of the interaction of all these uses together sort of make the place whole. So what else is Union Square missing? What do folks you know, think could come in here and support it? We've already heard a, a drugstore you know, would, might be a, a helpful addition. Um, so start to think about things along that line. And then on the design side of making local retail function, it's really about the scale of the storefront, you know, that range, so that there's a lot of different things happening along the block face. That's really important to keep Main Streets uh, healthy and keep local retail viable, as well as the scale of these, so that they're actually sized appropriately for smaller build businesses, independently owned businesses, to support the, the rent and the economics of it. Um, and then, how do they work together? You know, you have a Main Street organization. You know, how can all of these businesses have cooperative marketing, 
uh, similar hours. You know, they have to compete with, in the trade area of Union Square, they have to compete with, with a number of places in, in Boston as well as in Cambridge. Um, so essentially managed uh, you know, district is, is an interesting idea we should talk about further. So cycling, that's a really, you know, that, I like to think about cycling as not just, you know, sort of how, uh, uh, as an integrated part of the transportation system here in the greater Boston area. And Somerville is actually unique about, uh, among Boston as one of the most uh, cycle friendly or cycling, most number of cyclist commuters uh, uh, in this part of the country. But to start this, how do we actually integrate this into the lifestyle of, of folks getting around the city. And you can look here, the transit time from Union Square to downtown Boston right now, it, you, know, you have sort of a wide variety of, of times. But if you were to bike, you know, it's pretty consistent. You can get someplace at, at the same time. So what I've found is, is it's just quicker, it's more convenient to get around by bicycle in, in this part of, of the world. So how do we do that? You know, we have to actually make places that are comfortable and make bike cycling as easy to do as driving or walking. Um, so New York has been doing this a lot. You know, you can see this, you know, this is before and after, and you can, it's, you know, they've been tracking this data. You can see as cycling risk has gone down, ridership has gone up. So as we put more infrastructure in, more people are apt to, to use their cycle to get around. If you look at places that do this really, really well, that have a large percentage of their ridership in and around the city by bicycle, such as Copenhagen, you can see that it becomes a way of life. It's, it's just integrated into the fabric of, of the city, both at a, a cycle lane or cycle track standpoint, but also about how the people behave and how the cars interact with people, how people shop, um, you know, how they just get around the city. So if you take that to, the, to, to how do we get there from here, uh, is most cyclists are in this 60%. They're interested but concerned. So how do we actually make those folks you know, enthused and confident. And that has a lot to do with both infrastructure as well as just little small tweaks, such as parking. So how do we move those along? So if you see here, Boston is, is at the top of this list for bicycle commuters. So we've already got a, people, a lot of people who are enthused, but how do we move the, more into that? And one is just simple tweaks like parking. You know, you see folks locking bikes up around Boston and Somerville and Cambridge on anything that's inanimate. You know, and some cities are even getting comical about it, where these meters are only there to chain bicycles to. So how do we actually make little tweaks like cycling, you know, bicycles, racks, all of that integrated into the neighborhood? So that gets to development. How can, how can the development that's going to occur in Union Square be contextual? This is not contextual. This is you know, not friendly with what's there now. So, how, so, so there's some, just some general sort of guidelines that has kind of been, the city's been look, looking at for a long time. Some of it's embedded into the new zoning code that's been proposed. Um, but it's simple things like, you know, buildings should have a base, a middle, and a top. You know, buildings should have, you know, a rhythm and a, you know, that's related to, the, to their neighbors and a scale that's appropriate. Um, the proportion of window openings, horizontal versus vertical, you know, how do they relate to the, to the existing structures that, that are in, in Union Square? And then the respect for the street wall. You know, how, you know, the street is sort of the main, the outdoor room, the public space. So how do new buildings sort of relate to that, that street and behave properly? Um, so that gets us to the sort of the final thing. Public space in Union Square, you know, we've heard a lot of feedback saying we want more of it. How do we have more parks, more open space? So the other idea is how can we use the open space that's already here better and provide more opportunity for it? Uh, so on an average, you can see that you know, there's a substantial amount of open space that needs to, to be added to, to, to Somerville. Um, the comprehensive plan has a target of I think 120, 150 acres, but you can see there's some gaps in where, you know, where open space is in Union Square. So what we're going to look at during this thread is how can we actually maybe create some new parks or new squares. Um, and you can see in Union Square, it's kind of, you know, it's on the low end of, of open space that's provided for residents right now. Um, so that leads us to thinking about, you know, how can we get creative with what we have already? And that's just, you know, this sort of idea of the open space is, it is where you, where you are. How can we just use this space differently? Uh, so the idea of parklets, you know, how can we use little parking spaces, create these little slivers of park, uh, of public space embedded in the neighborhood. And then just thinking about how we use the sidewalks differently, you know, and how they can, you know, during the life of the day, it changes. Um, and this is not a new concept. I mean, this, this is in New York in the, in the 1900s, but the street was the public space for most neighborhoods. And, and you know, commerce as well as the sort of, you know, people enjoying and talking and, you know, all of it occurred in the, in the street. 
So you know, other cities around the country are doing this now and really using creative ways of thinking about it. So these are actually the alleys in Melbourne, Australia, where they've actually created these into some of the most vibrant little uh, cafe and, and, and restaurant districts in their center of their city. And these used to be where they stored trash and, and all. So how can we start to think about you know, these little nooks and crannies of Union Square uh, of being really vibrant uh, public spaces? And it can be you know, both you know, plaza as well as green you know, sort of square and, and, and piazza. Uh, but at the end of the day, the public space is about how, that's where life happens, that's where people connect and where things really occur. So what we want to hear from you is, what do you want to do in those spaces? What, do you, what can you not do in Union Square now that you need a space for? So that we can start to think about, well, where, does, where can we put that? Um, so this is where we get, you know, what, we want to hear about you know, what you think. So today is all about visioning. So this is kind of blue sky thinking, you know, what, what do we really have to change about the square? What do we really have to preserve about the square? So there's a, there's a sheet of paper that has instructions on it. So I'd encourage folks in the back to get a, get a chair and join one of these tables. But the first activity here is, is the mapping activity. So there's some markers. We really want you to, to draw and, and, and write and any idea or any concern you might have, draw it on the map. Circle it, write about it, you know, and talk to your neighbor, your, your table mates about what, you know, what the issue is. So, so, so just some general instructions before you get into it. Is inter make sure you know everyone at your table, introduce yourself. Pick a spokesperson. Because at the end of our exercises today, so we want to hear from you. So someone should be taking good notes and kind of understanding everything so they can report back. And then really write and draw as much as possible. We're going to keep these maps and document them, so it's important that you write clearly. If it's a great idea, you know, put a star on it. You know, so really convey, this, uh, convey what you're talking about on these maps. Uh, and then there's a lot of questions we've added to these instructions for you guys to, to read and sort of you know, kind of help you along the way. Um, so give yourselves about 15 minutes to get into the mapping, and, and then we'll come back and do the second activity. We're going to transition to our second activity now. If you feel free as you as you transition to this next activity, if there's something comes up that you want to add to your map, go ahead and do it. So this isn't the end of the mapping exercise, but we should transition to the visual preference survey. So a visual preference survey is we want to we've given you a stack of photographs of of places or buildings that represent different ideas. We want you to tell us if you like it like the image or don't like the image. So write directly on the fo photo, tell us if it, yes, this is something we see that could be in Union Square in the future, or no, this is not something we see in Union Square in the future. And then if there's a detail you like, you like a window or you like a balcony, circle it and, and write some notes on the, on the photo as well. So we're going we're gonna to take all these back from you and process them so we can understand what people like and don't like. So feel free to go through and talk about each photo with your table and mark them up. So we'll give you guys about 20 minutes to do this portion of the activity. Uh, another, yeah. George? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, folks, about the photo survey, what is really, really most helpful to us is if there's something you, particularly something you don't like that you tell us why, 
right on the front, right on the back, right wherever you can on it. But tell us what it is about that photo that you like or don't like, and then tell us why you feel that way. Um, thank you. Feel free to sort of put your last thoughts down on the on your photo, and then we're going to have a, a, a presentation on uh, the US2, D2, D3 to kind of introduce these specific development sites, and then we'll have an activity uh, specific for those two sites. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Alfredo from Stantec, he's a, a master plan architect for, for US2, and then Eric Howler from Howler and Union will talk specifically about the, uh, the D2 parcel. So Alfredo? That's already in. Perfect. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alfredo Landaeta. Can, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, no, no? Wow, well, this doesn't really work as a, as a PA system, so. Um, I'll just come a little bit forward. That probably will be better. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Alfredo Landaeta, as I was saying. I'm, I'm leading the urban design and planning efforts for the US2 team. And we wanted to basically uh, walk you through a bit of what we've been doing and explain you why we're doing the things the way we are doing them. So essentially, US2 was selected as a, as a master developer for the what is being called the disposition parcels. And that happened a, quite a, a few months ago. And it was actually selected on the promise that uh, we will be uh, engaging, listening, synthesizing, and creating a great place for, 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 Union, State, for Union Square. Uh, just so you actually get a bit of a sense of the scale, I mean, the neighborhood plan has a pretty wide sort of a, a area of influence. The disposition parcels that we're going to be master planning in detail as after the, the neighborhood plan finishes his, uh, uh, his process are these seven parcels here. And out of those parcels, D2 and D3 are the two ones that are going to be coming online and going to be developed first. So it's extremely important that, that we actually get it right, uh, because it's actually the first things that are going to be actually hitting the ground as developments. Uh, so, uh, but through this time, we have not been idle. I mean, we've been doing a lot of work. We've been doing what we've been calling the 100-day plan that has uh, included uh, quite a few different aspects. I mean, one of those obviously has been going through in-depth uh, revision of all the previous material, and most of that what uh, Ross already mentioned, uh, summary by design, uh, the, the different master plans uh, and the different uh, uh, planning frameworks that the city has created. Uh, we've been going uh, very carefully looking into what the, the fair share of uh, the neighborhood of uh, Somerville by design and uh, summer vision applies to Union Square and then how we actually translate that into the disposition parcels. We've been doing a lot of uh, background uh, research in infrastructure uh, services to the different lots, uh, looking into the MBTA specifically uh, relationship between D2 and the train station and all that that implies from the accessibility point of view, servicing, and so on. Uh, we've actually been doing quite a bit of um, a, a research in terms of uh, brownfield conditions and so on. So we try to get a really good picture of what it will take to develop these parcels uh, in a relatively uh, quick uh, uh, time frame. But mostly we've actually been 
uh, sort of uh, listening and engaging uh, the community in many, many different ways. Uh, US2 has been present in a whole, or has been hosting uh, a lot of these uh, uh, events. Uh, we've been requesting and obtaining a huge amount of feedback from the community in different forms, uh, sometimes in a fairly informal uh, way, uh, like in the, in the kickoff and the startup sessions. Uh, we've been documenting all this. Uh, in some other cases, it's been much more smaller, it was in a one-to-one -one or small meetings um, with uh, community uh, activists, with groups, with interested people. Uh, we actually have had inter in detailed interviews with over 25 organizations and groups of very different uh, um, uh, or, uh, orientations and, and interests. And essentially, we've been trying to come together with uh, what we heard uh, as, a, as a very consistent package of, of uh, ideas and thoughts. And what we heard is been very, very consistent with uh, everything that's been coming from Summer Vision and from the previous Somerville by Design. We heard that you want something memorable from, for uh, Union Square. You don't want out of the shelf, generic approach to design, planning, architecture. Uh, you want something that is very much uniquely Union Square. Uh, you want housing, and specifically there's a lot of desire about affordable housing. There is a strong desire for, for what is being defined as useful, useful retail, not so many sort of expensive coffee houses, but things that the community actually needs and, and uses. Um, there's a strong desire for diversity, and that's actually part of the DNA of Union Square. Uh, but it's not only diversity of architecture, it's also diversity of opportunities and uses and, and people. I mean, bringing some new people into the, the community. There is a desire for art and civic spaces and civic buildings. And it's an appreciation for those strange and whimsical spaces that actually pop up all over uh, Union Square and, and Somerville. As a balance of the new and the old, uh, this is not a tabula rasa, it's not something that is going to come all with new buildings, there has to be a balance between the two. Uh, it's a, an encouragement of local ownership of businesses and, uh, and local uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, there's a desire for commercial space, specifically office, so there is an employment base for the, the city and uh, there's an increase in the, the tax base. And we're probably missing a few things. So part of these exercises is actually get your feedback, uh, understand if we, if we are missing something, if there's something that is really uh, important that, that we should be starting to consider as part of this uh, uh, development of these parcels. So to that effect, you can reach us, uh, either Twitter, email. I mean, uh, this information is widely available. Um, but I mean, we can, in a way, we can take it slow. I mean, we're starting the process. It's a long process. I mean, right now, what we have as a, as a community engagement process uh, is goes at least all the way to, 20, to end of 2015. We're just starting. We're in the, in the very first uh, uh, steps. And the way the process is structured is that you will see the red bar. That's the neighborhood plan. You see the yellow bar. That's the, the, the disposition parcels, detail master planning process. And then you see the gray bar down here, which is the, 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 the public consultation process for D2 and D3. And this is important because uh, the construction of D2, uh, or the first phase of D2, although it feels that it has to be concurrent, uh, it has to open concurrently with the, the T station that is scheduled to open in December of 2017. Um, in order for us to make that deadline, we actually have to start planning and designing D2 right now. Uh, it seems like a long time, but actually it's a pretty compressed uh, timeline. So to that effect, we have a, a pretty active 2015 with a lot of activities and public engagement going on, uh, which actually look a little bit like that. I mean, we right now are right there. Uh, January 31st, we have the, the last of the visioning sessions. Um, we are actually having next Wednesday the first of the uh, what we be calling the, 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 the detailed workshops for D2 and D3. Although we're gonna always going to be talking about the three scales of development, we're going to be talking about the neighborhood plan scale, we're going to be talking about the disposition parcels, and then we're going to be focusing on D2 and D3. And essentially, we have uh, four workshops in February, as Ross mentioned. One, the first one is about placemaking, landscape art. I mean, what kind of environment we want to see around the, the, the square and how D2 and D3 can contribute to that. 
Uh, the second one is about real estate, uh, and at the end of the day, there has to be uh, a successful real estate uh, development happening in order for the community benefits to happen as well. Uh, the third one is about uh, the project realities, I mean specifically about what is going on in terms of infrastructure, traffic, parking, and so on, that will, have, uh, will impact and will uh, help, uh, will frame the development of these projects. And the last one is a very specific uh, D2, D3 massing workshop. And what we want is to start presenting some ideas based on what we've been developing so far. And Harler and Yoon has been actually the, the, the lead on this one. And uh, at the same time, get a lot of feedback from you in uh, how that works, uh, how that looks like, and how we can actually develop a project that fits really well with the, 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 the neighborhood. And then after that, <coughs> We have the design charrette uh, in March that is going to be a city and US2 uh, effort. Uh, we have the plan opera house in May. And after that, the, we have between two and three community engagement uh, meetings for the D parcels specifically. So like you can see, it's a pretty aggressive timeline. It's a lot of meetings. Uh, so far, it's been great. I mean, the community has been extremely enthusiastic about the, the process and has been uh, uh, providing us with a huge amount of feedback. So we want to keep the momentum going um, and uh, we want to start sort of giving you uh, our thoughts and our uh, ideas so we actually we can get a lot of feedback from you if we're on the right track and how things are, are shaping up. Um, Eric Howler from Howler and Yoon uh, is going to give you uh, an additional presentation on, on specifically about uh, what we've been thinking about, uh, about public realm and D2 and D3. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Eric Howler. I'm from Howler Yoon Architecture. Uh, we're an architecture firm in Boston. We're working with Alfredo uh, and with US2 to start sort of the architectural master planning for the D2 parcel. Uh, and as we design, uh, we like to sort of find out what the opportunities are, what the constraints are, and we're working with um, the city of Somerville, with the principal group and UTIL to sort of um, communicate also and, and hear from you uh, what the uh, ambitions are for these parcels. Um, as, as we all know, the Green Line is going to transform the neighborhood. It's going to transform Union Square, uh, and it's going to expand the boundaries, what you think about as Union Square might be more limited. As the Green Line comes, it's going to expand that uh, towards the south. Um, but we noticed that Union Square has always been a crossroads. It's always been a confluence of these different transportation systems. Um, and that's going to be true for the Green Line extension. Uh, this new confluence of, of rail, road, path, and place uh, will impact the square in a major way. Uh, it's uh, uh, inevitable. Um, but we noticed, as we look at the history of Somerville, uh, that Somerville has always sort of changed. Um, and that's part of the unique character of Somerville, is a function of that change. It's a function of that confluence of transportation systems, of industry, of, of, of immigration. Um, so when we look at what is Union Square, what is its character, um, we know that the, the fabric is diverse. We know that the sort of demographics are diverse. Um, they're funky. and Authentic. These are things that are sort of ways to describe Union Square and its, and its population. Um, so our challenge is how do we manage uh, this change while maintaining the character of Union Square? So it's change, but we have to maintain something authentic and something real. Um, the D2 and D3 parcels are going to form a gateway. When the train comes, those are the two parcels that are going to bookend that train station. And in a way, they're going to create this gateway, this welcome mat, this entry sequence into the square. Um, so the connection between the train station and Union Square is 600 feet. And as we look at D2, we think about that 600 feet and what the responsibility of that building or those buildings are towards that street, towards that public realm. So we say it's going to create this public link uh, between the station and the existing square. However, when you go there today, uh, the situation along that link, that 600 feet, is underutilized. Um, in some cases, foreboding. There's uses there that are not conducive to public life, to social interaction, to congregation. Um, so our charge is to make the D2 parcel activate the public realm that it's a part of. That's one of its major 
tasks is to activate that frontage. Um, and to be successful, we recognize that that interface between the private realm and the public realm along that 600-foot link will require careful attention. How do we design that? What goes in there? How that activates the street? Um, but we have to consider the constraints, uh, and there are many, uh, in terms of grade, in terms of contamination, in terms of setbacks, in terms of access, uh, and the opportunities, the aspirations. And so here we wanted to share with you some of those constraints, so you know what the situation is, and some of those aspirations, what we want this place to be like. Um, so, can you hear me okay? Am I shouting too much? Okay. So, okay. It's just for the camera, though. It's a, it's a placebo. It'll make me s seem louder. Um, maybe I'll hold it down, so. Okay, so what's changed about Union Square? We know that the Green Line currently stops at Lechmere. Um, in the future, it'll get to Union Square, okay? Uh, that, the D2 and D3 parcels, we know is gonna bookend that station. Um, and I think Alfredo already mentioned some of the, the different parcels around there. Uh, so the first two are D2 and D3, because those are gonna be underway. And as he said, we wanna finish the first buildings when the train station opens. So when it opens, you come out of the train, you don't want to step into a construction site. There comes a T. Uh, what does the station look like? This station has already been designed, it's already been bid, and I believe it's already under construction. So that that we're connecting to, we have to know what that is. So we look at the plans of this station. It's actually a, a beautiful station. It connects to the top of the bridge. So it's got two levels. You can enter up here on the upper plaza and down here at grade, so it's a two-level a two level station. Um, and it's got this visor, it's also set back about 30 feet from the bridge, and it's connecting to that bridge. So as we build in front of it, how does our new development engage or, or, or touch or connect to this station? So there's Union Square, there's the station, that's the Prospect Street Corridor. Um, and there's the D2 parcel. So you can see that there's going to be a lot of uh, impact on that connection. Across the street, you know, there's the electrical substation, you know, so it's not much we can do with that. So I think the, the emphasis is going to be on, on the eastern side. Um, the D3 parcel will, will frame the access uh, into this part of, of Somerville and towards Cambridge. Um, but we have to see this as a network of urban spaces, as a network of connections, links, shortcuts, the way people live and use these streets. And there's the kind of concept of the gateway. These two need to be thought of together. They need to be planned together, designed together, and because that's the way they'll be experienced. So the D2 parcel, we say 600 feet, and what's our responsibility? We need to make that 600 feet awesome. It needs to be welcoming. It needs to be public and active. It needs to be safe. Um, so, but currently, what do we have there? We have a lot of uses that are sort of under, underperforming, urbanistically speaking, um, and this is changing. The sidewalk along that bridge, you know that sidewalk, it's narrow, it's steep, it's dangerous. Um, what can we do? What's across the street, the substation? We can't do much with that. Maybe we can screen it, maybe we can plant something on it, maybe we can have public art on it. Um, so we're looking at this sidewalk, it's about, four and a half feet wide. It's really incredibly narrow. Uh, but we're trying to avoid this. We don't want the public realm to be a construction site. And so how do we plan for that? We need to plan now because it's going to become a construction site very soon. As architects, we look at street sections. So we cut a section, say, through the sidewalk where we see the car, the sidewalk, and the building. And what can we do to improve that experience? We can add bike lanes and parking. Um, we can add trees and planting. Um, we can add seating. We can add awnings. Um, and most importantly, we need to program those spaces so that the uses that go in there actually activate the street. So people are there, they're walking there, they're going to a hardware store, they're going to a coffee shop. Um, and we want that retail to sort of open and close. We want that, that boundary, that interface to be porous. We want the sidewalk to sort of open up and we want the street life to sort of spill out. So the D2 and D3 parcels, um, we were thinking about that whole edge, 
along Prospect Street and how that edge is going to activate the sidewalk and activate the public realm. It's about 550 feet to the south and about 600 feet to the north. So our considerations, how do you enter the T-Station? It's got this level change because you're entering off of the bridge, the upper entrance and the lower entrance. And that's nice. It's also a challenge. How do you connect there? Inside the station, there'll be an elevator, there'll be an escalator, there'll be a stair. But we feel like outside there, we also need a connection to get those two levels. We also understand from the MBTA that there's a setback. We cannot build right up to the station. We have to set back 35 feet. So that creates a kind of buffer zone, which will, be, um, which will have uh, a, a turnaround for, uh, for the ride, which is the accessibility system for the T. Um, but currently, it's like this. And there's that 15-foot drop. So how do we negotiate that? When the station is open, you can go inside and take the escalator or the elevator. When the station is closed, we think we need to provide a, a public stair, a grand stair. Maybe it could be something, something great. So this diagram shows the parcel here, the lower and upper entrance, and that 15-foot drop. We think some sort of grand public stair could be a nice feature to connect the upper plaza and the lower plaza. Uh, when we look at urban spaces, we found a lot of spaces we love that have urban stairs, and this is in Paris along the Seine. Uh, this is in, in Germany where the stair becomes an artwork. Um, and in Hong Kong, you know, famously hilly city where, where the kind of grade change is negotiated through all kinds of little terraces and landings, uh, inventive retail that occupies the steps. Um, historic cities on slopes manage to integrate uh, planters and doorways, places to hang out, like urban stoops. Um, in Brazil, decorated stairs. Um, and my favorite is in Santiago, this stramp, which is a stair ramp, where the, the handicap access is in, integrated uh, into this grand stair. So we think the stair is an opportunity to create a kind of an activated public realm that negotiates that 15-foot drop. Uh, it could be planted. There could be you know, creative planting. Um, so how do we manage the slope now from that bridge all the way down to Union Square? where we have 15 feet of drop. Um, how do we create enough landings there along the sidewalk that the retail can actually enter? Because right now, that's, that's pretty steep. Um, so we're thinking about the retail having to step uh, along the bridge and along the street just to be able to get in and out. Um, we're also trying to make that slope uh, easy and accessible. Right now, it's quite steep. And we're trying to spread that out and introduce landings uh, to make that much more um, accessible. We're looking at examples, not all of them good, but this is around uh, Fenway, where it's the same situation. You have a, a highway ramp, and you have retail, and this kind of this level change. How do you negotiate that and still make it active and, and uh, inviting? Um, we look at cities like San Francisco that have managed to negotiate their, their slopes, and you know, planters create little retaining walls. Um, you know, I love this, where you know, people are sitting here, and, the, and this is all about managing that slope. And so we think this is also an opportunity, uh, not just to provide kind of generic retail, but actually to provide retail that has character, that could spill out, that could integrate the level change into a kind of urban stoop situation. Even a simple store like this has to sort of negotiate that slope and create a level of flatness to enter. And then there's maybe not the greatest examples. There's examples where there's a terrace uh, that creates a barrier between the retail and the street. So we want to try to avoid some of these problems and create this inviting interface between public and private. Um, what happens on the sidewalk? Um, like we said, this is so narrow, it's five feet wide. You can hardly get a baby stroller up there. Um, so maybe, and there's the sight line to the T-Station. Eventually, you're going to walk up Prospect Street to get to that T-Station. Uh, what happens on the sidewalk? People sit, they hang out, they play games. How can we be creative with the sidewalk? Can it create a kind of sidewalk culture like this sort of temporary seating uh, in a scaffold in New York. Um, we have a kind of traditional idea of sidewalk, a European idea. Um, but things that happen on sidewalks are surprising. You know, that's why we love public spaces, because things happen that don't happen in private realm. Public art. Um, so what kind of programs are going to go into these spaces? Um, we've looked around. We've seen a lot of great restaurants in Union Square. Uh, we've heard from people that they're interested in, in local, uh, useful retail, um, convenience stores, hardware stores, dry cleaners, 
uh, pharmacy. Um, so how do we en encourage these kind of retailers to come and occupy space um, along Prospect Street? So our first diagram is like, well, we've got 600 feet potential frontage here, but we don't want it to be generic. We want it to be broken up at a finer grain, maybe with a certain rhythm. So it feels interesting to walk along and discover things there. Uh, so we started to show some storefronts along that slope. And how do we create those landings and create those, those storefronts that retailers would come and occupy? Um, we know there's great sidewalks in Boston. Um, there's great examples in Europe of streetscapes that are sort of broken up into smaller pieces so it doesn't feel like you're walking along a single building. This is broken up by different architects working on these different um, sliver buildings. Um, even in LA, the idea of this kind of arch where different retailers occupy different, uh, they sort of plug into different arches within this building. Um, so we think we're not going to provide a kind of generic box. We're going to provide differentiated retail spaces of different scales where different tenants could take, take those spaces. Uh, we look at the local um, context and Air and Out Brewery as a model. We look at uh, the Unium as a kind of, uh, as a sort of space that could be rented out by different groups. Um, we look at maker spaces that seem to encourage a sort of culture of, of making and, and, and innovation. Uh, we look at hardware stores. These are programs that I think everybody uh, wants because they sort of build on what's already happening in Union Square, the kind of culture of, of, of uh, independent, um, creative people. What other amenities do we need to provide here? So uh, we heard a lot about biking and, and, and uh, bike safety. Um, we need to provide bicycle parking both at the upper plaza and the lower plaza. Um, how do we organize that in a way that's efficient and, 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 and clean? Um, in New York, there are these great sort of designs for bike racks that are somehow uh, integrated into the cityscape better. Um, we also have to consider the ride, which is a, a service that is provided uh, to users of the, of the transit system, um, and they have to have a place to drop off and, and turn around, um, which is currently in the plan here to drop off at the, at the lower station. Uh, so some, those are some of the constraints. We need to integrate these things, but we want to say that these constraints are design opportunities. We can find inventive solutions to all of these, um, all of these level changes, all of these slopes, all of these, um, all of these uses. So for us, we try to summarize all these things here. Uh, we have the ride drop-off, we have the setback, we have the slope situation, we have residential edges that require special care, uh, and there's also the, the potential of, of the soil contamination. So what are we going to do with all those constraints and still design something awesome? So uh, we're going to break into another activity. Um, we've, we've done uh, two of the mapping and the visual preferences. There is another activity which is underneath the aerial photograph, uh, which is loosely tied to some of the themes that I raised. So um, there's a series of questions that are posed in the margin of this um, in the margin of this map, uh, and we're asking you to sort of answer some of these questions. Um, and I'll go through the questions quickly together, and then I'll have you break up and, and try to answer them as a group. But when the T station opens, uh, what are the qualities? that you would like to see in the public stair? Um, that's the first question. How, what else could a public stair be? Could it be seating? Could it be performance space? Could it be art? Um, the second question is, the, what amenities and services are important uh, to have in the neighborhood around the T station? So when you get home from work, you come off the T, what do you expect to find there within the first 600 feet of a T station? Uh, so we'd like you to try to fill this in in writing, but also in drawing form. If you want to draw and diagram something on the plan, please do so. Um, the Prospect Street sidewalk between Union Square and Windsor Place should be what? What is the aspiration for that sidewalk? What would you like it to transform into beyond a simple connection? When the T opens, we want to see X on the D2 building's ground floor. What do you think should go there? What's appropriate? What would stimulate it? What would make it safe? Uh, and the last one, when you're standing on the corner of the SCATV uh, and you look up towards the T station, what would you like to see? Would you like to see lots of little buildings? Would you like to see one big building? Would you like to see five different colors? Would you like to see six different materials? Would you like to see different activities? So tell us what you expect to see from here looking at the T station and what we could do to help you 
uh, transform that link and make it awesome. That's the exercise. Uh, please take your time with your group. Um, talk about some of those issues. Slopes, what could those be? Sidewalks, what could those be? And write those things down for us, please. The chairs. So I want to thank everyone for, for participating today. We, we're, as we're sort of summarizing here, we're going to go around to each table. And I'd like each table to tell us their three big ideas or three big discussion items uh, that you talked about throughout today. You know, so from the mapping exercise at the whole neighborhood scale to I want, you know, maybe show us your, your favorite photograph, you know, something that you really want to share with the group. And then uh, your most interesting or thoughtful discussion you had about D2 and D3. So if you could give us those three items from each group, that'd be great. So uh, does there anyone want to go first? Okay, so um, our group focused a lot on multi-generational and multicultural. So whenever we were thinking of a, whenever we were thinking of a space, um, a lot of us are at a, are kind of at a younger time in life, but we kept remembering like, that there are a lot of older people in the community 
And so that came up a lot for us whenever we thought of a space was how each generation would use it and how it could fit the needs of many cultures. Um, and then we were really drawn to green spaces. I think Union's very, very dense. And we've just, anytime we saw green in any of our photos, especially if it's planned, but it still has the ability to feel organic, we were like, all of us were very gung-ho on that. So we really were, resonated with green space. And I would say um, intimacy and ambiance within public space. So we also really liked the places where you could have little moments with your friends, but you're still in the public. So you didn't feel like closed off, you felt welcomed, but you could also have your own moments in those public spaces. And what about the D2 and D3 parcels? What was the... um, for us, we thought a lot about like modularity and seasonal change. So how a space could be different depending on, like we would bring up like amphitheaters, but also shuttles for um, winter use. Um, oh, we also really liked the the mix of old and new within the like structural community here is like open to like new and modernity, but we don't want to replace all of the old. We like the feeling of seeing the passage of time through the buildings themselves. Right. So we like that juxtaposition. Thank you. Thank you. We also wanted it to be like multi-generational and multicultural in our use, and so thinking about daycares, thinking about elderly, and having space that's right next to public transportation that's also all about the community. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, so why don't we move over to this table? Thank you, table one. Who would like to report out? Lucy? Um, so uh, we really liked the idea also of, of having more greenery um, and we liked the, uh, the we, we thought affordable housing was important as well um, and uh, let's see this was our favorite picture I'd say we liked the kind of inviting ambiance um, and a mixture of old and new as well we felt it was uniquely Somerville kind of looking or the, we, we would like a space that, that looks uniquely Somerville couldn't be Houston or something um, and let's see, for the, the D2 and, and D3 spaces, uh, we also wanted to have greenery. We thought maybe in front of the power station having art or some kind of greenery would be cool, kind of echoing a little bit like the, the cool utilities boxes that people have painted around town. Um, let's see. Uh, um, I would say that we reacted really strongly to atmosphere um, in terms of size and height. And I think we talked a lot about how like the more the mall feel was happening already in Assembly Row and the more corporate feel was happening in Kendall with really large buildings and really large spaces. And Union Square seemed much more conducive to smaller spaces being used really well. So we talked more about that and really reacted to photos based on that idea. All right, thanks table two. All right, how about this table, table three? Um, so our three items I think that we talked about mostly, one was um, open spaces. Again, I think you guys said just like the having spaces, even if they're mini parks, but places where people can gather. Um, we also talked about uh, affordable food options. A lot of the members of our group are high school students and said that they would be much more likely to come to Union Square if there were you know, affordable food options to get with their friends. And again, these like little places to gather and sit and parks, that kind of thing. Um, Along those lines, we talked about a lot of the like accessibility around um, traffic and and like an easy way to bike into the the um, area, especially from the high school area, but also just in general a lot of like the bike access. Um, and we got into a conversation about being able to sort of like looking at the streets, being able to change some of the directionality of the streets to kind of um, open up some more of that open space area if people didn't have to sort of do these circles around um, driving in circles kind of around those spaces. So those were our three big ones. Tony, did you want to show our pictures? Okay, so I think we were all really drawn to the open spaces in this sort of wetland photo. And then um, one of the, but we thought that like the modern style was not really, in the background was not really what, we were not as attracted to it. Um, and then this other photo where they took turned the parking spot into a green space, we thought it was really inspiring, but we, we thought that um, none of the pictures showed winter uses and we felt like that was really missing of like what happens to a parking spot in the winter, like can this be a, accessible in the winter as well. We had winter on our brains today. <laughs> I think that's it. Right. Table three. Um, all right, so table four. So one thing we talked a lot about was, can you all hear me? Okay. One thing we talked a lot about is the integration of D2 and D3 
through D6 into the rest of the square. And so thinking about everything that happens there being complementary to what we already have. So for example, people mentioned like maybe we need a dry cleaner in D2, but will that then take away from the dry cleaner we already have a block away? And so how could we then create, for example, um, Gustavo mentioned like a drop off for the same dry cleaner who could operate the same space to be complementary to the businesses and business owners that are already here in the square. And we also talked about uh, like in D3, maybe that's a place where there's a lot of offices or um, uh, not things that necessarily are going to draw you into the square, whereas D2 is a way to draw people down into the rest of Union Square. And uh, one idea we talked about was taking uh, the staircase and have that, that corridor along Prospect Street essentially be like an extension of that staircase um, as one uh, wide setback that would, rather than that, as it is now, the really narrow uh, sidewalk, a wide setback that has maybe seating areas or various um, different kind of setbacks for restaurants or whatever is going to be there as a way to uh, make that a walkable, inviting space for people to come down into, um, into the SCTV area or the uh, Somerville Community TV area. Um, and again, draw, make D2 not its own place, but a, um, draw people to the rest of Union Square. We didn't pick a favorite photo, um, <laughs> sorry, um, but we, a lot of what was already shared was some of the things, some of the yes. same photos we had called out. I looked, for example, at a couple of the coffee shop photos and I thought, like, which coffee shops are going to be the most, like, inviting for everyone in the square, um, where you feel like anyone in the square um, across all demographics could go into that coffee shop and feel welcome. Um, so that's, that was kind of a moment that I had looking at some of the photos. Yeah this sort of two. I was like, hmm, that one looks like I might get a $6 coffee. And then there was another one with a garage door. And I was like, oh, I can go in there and get like a $2 coffee. So I think just like, what does the space look like that it feels inviting to everyone in the square across all demographic lines? Uh, and, and to add to that, uh, we wanted, we did not want a big um, a cookie cutter, giant monolith building. Uh, we wanted something that was broken up and had different setbacks. I don't know. This one, I think we decided was sort of cookie cuttery, but there were others that looked like giant, uh, giant blocks, and that didn't seem like the quality of, of Union Square. So, thank you. Thanks. Um, so I think when we talked, we talked a lot about um, just the overall traffic flow and making sure that things work for everyone, um, including bike lanes and opening up the roadways, either by two-way roads or other other opportunities, so that the square is accessible for everyone and everyone can get to and from different places pretty easily, not just the D2, D3 parcels, but just all around Union Square, even outside the kind of the development areas that are going on. Um, we also thought that having a lot of uh, kind of community meeting space would be good, um, especially to have a uh, green area and places that really focus on having art or other performance um, spaces would be good. There's a lot of places like the stairs that people were talking about or the power station um, where I think there'd be a lot of opportunity to put art um, around there. Um, and then in terms of buildings, I think uh, overall we wanted more of a mix of buildings and things that fit the overall character of the square. Um, not just one giant building that took up a lot of the footprint, um, but more different types of buildings and kind of unique areas, um, although the D3 area might be more right for some density. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that when things get put in for the retail around D2 and everything, it's stuff that helps people who are living here and things that we might want to get when we're going home and we can stop in and get something instead of just high-end retail stores. Um, we picked three because we don't follow directions very well. Um, so we like this photo are just spaces that we already have that we can reuse. Um, and then two uh, green spaces. And I think some of us really like the fact that um, this had kind of a change in gradations and it was kind of mixed up a little bit instead of just a flat um, area. Yeah, so our, our discussion focused mostly on trying to create uh, as interesting 
and pleasant a place in Union Square in the future development as we could. Our favorite picture um, was this one right here for um, multiplicity of reasons. Uh, the wide sidewalks that permits a wide variety of uses, the uh, benches uh, and picnic tables that promote kind of public use of the sidewalks, as well as the storefront, which is just a very inviting place, a very open place, and a very kind of unique place that would promote, uh, that would kind of interest people in coming to Union Square. A lot of our specific discussion focused on uh, kind of what we wanted the area around the D2 development to look like, and I think the, uh, we thought that the most important um, kind of points we made about that was that it should be uh, there should be a strong emphasis on mixed use. So should, there should not only be um, interesting and useful kind of storefront, uh, re uh, retail stores, stores, pharmacies, but there should also be uh, green space. For example, maybe uh, man-made grassy hills or additional kind of stramps and access paths down to the uh, station, uh, in addition to kind of affordable housing and other kind of residential areas as well. Um, Everything else we kind of talked about was along a similar theme. Uh, one of the things we discussed earlier during the math making activity uh, was possibly uh, getting rid of or shrinking the parking lot around the Brass Union Independent Bronwyn area to just promote and create a larger space for kind of just like general public use. Um, yeah, any important points I missed, do you think? Got them. Yeah? All right, our last table. Um, we wanted to uh, make sure that the historic buildings in Union Square are preserved and that the small business and small scale character of Union Square are preserved at the same time that the kind of um, eclectic mix that we have right now of the buildings is um, maintained and also that uh, at the same time that the square has more of a visual unity to it, possibly by, for instance, the lights that were installed along Somerville Avenue are very attractive, and something like that that could be extended to the outer reaches, reaches of Union Square could serve to um, unify the streetscape and still maintain the eclectic mix of buildings and storefronts and, um, and facades. Um, one of our members spoke very, spoke very strongly about um, avoiding creating dark shadows by, by the use of tall buildings. And he also suggested creating walking paths up from Union Square to Prospect Hill Tower, one of the city's most historic sites. Um, let's see. I, I, I'm going to do a little disclosure here. Eric and I are both on the Stark Preservation Commission and Brandon is the staff director, but we did have other people <laughs> who were not part of the preservation. So, um, do you have anything else to, if I, to add, Eric? Just here? The, D, the D2. The so. D2 um, part of it. Favorite we, um, favorite photo was, oh, be you hard. guessed it, this. <laughs> And there, believe it or not, there are buildings in Union Square that could be restored to look just as good as this, even though now they don't look so great. They still have a lot of detail left on them, and um, we could have some a collection of very nice-looking buildings in the square um, with proper restoration. And B2, um, we think that um, coming up from the stairway from the station that... Um, there should be places for people to pause along the way as they come up the stairway and walk down Prospect Street into the heart of Union Square and that um, sort of um, pockets where there can be interaction with retail spaces. And um, I think that's it. What? what? Open space. Open uh, space. Yes, we wanted to, we wanted to um, make sure that there is, um, I mean, there is continues to be a flower cellar and nursery space somewhere in Union Square that creates both um, green space and um, is also retail retail space serves two purposes at the same time. And uh, we also wanted to see a movie theater in Union Square and um, other things. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. So uh, thanks all, everyone for hanging out with us here in the cold post office today. This is great feedback. Uh, February 4th here at 6.30 will be uh, the placemaking workshop. 
So join us then. And then SomervilleByDesign.com. All this information is going to get uploaded there over the next couple of weeks. Uh, go there for all information about upcoming meetings for Union Square as well as the larger uh, efforts around the city. Uh, so thanks a lot, everyone. We'll, we'll see you on the 4th.